Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Qualified immunity is something we've talked about quite a bit on this channel. And here's an interesting story. Jonathan and a bunch of other people sent it to me, but from Newsweek, Supreme Court decision slammed by judge. So a judge has come out and ripped on the Supreme Court and how it deals with qualified immunity. A Mississippi judge rebuked the U.S. Supreme Court for its definition of qualified immunity stemming from a 2020 murder case with one legal analyst telling Newsweek that it's part of a public shift in the law's interpretation. And so a lot of people are aware of qualified immunity now and are wondering how it came about and why it still exists. So Carlton Reeves is a district judge in Mississippi. He wrote an opinion, which was published this week, that the qualified immunity doctrine was invented by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1967 and essentially means that people wronged by government agents cannot sue the agents unless the nation's highest court previously found substantially the same acts to be unconstitutional. But Reeves said the doctrine has come to be an unconstitutional error that it is past time for the judiciary to correct this mistake. So remember, qualified immunity does not come from legislation. It's not a law that was passed. It was a holding of the Supreme Court where they just said, oh, we think this ought to be the law. So... Reeves wrote, the court agrees with these calls for change. Congress's intent to protect citizens from government abuse cannot be overridden by judges who think they know better. As a doctrine that defies this basic principle, qualified immunity is an unconstitutional error. It is past time for the judiciary to correct this mistake. So he gave an example of a case that he was familiar with, and this is a judge writing, uh, about a 2020 homicide. And the false accusation against a man who was accused of capital murder in a a crime that took place in Mississippi. Another man told law enforcement that the first man was responsible for the death. He was uh, subsequently indicted by a grand jury, even though he denied the allegations and any role in the crime. As the judge noted, the man was detained in the Hines County Detention Center and stayed in the inhumane facility while awaiting trial. Um, He claimed the jail was infested with rodents and snakes, that his cellmate was stabbed, that his food was moldy and stale, and that he often had to sleep on the cell floor while enduring constant yelling, violence, and fear. So the other man who had claimed that he'd heard this confession then recanted his story about the involvement, telling public defenders that he was drug impaired when he made a baseless accusation that the man had committed the crime. So the man lost nearly two years of his life, and he sued the detective who locked him up, her employer, and the operator of the detention center. So the judge says the man is now on the precipice of being wronged a third time, not by a rogue officer or jailer, but by the law itself, because the detective says the legal doctrine of qualified immunity requires the court to dismiss the man's claims against her. Now, a senior vice president for legal studies at the Cato Institute told Newsweek that that the ruling dates to federal civil rights laws following the Civil War. Uh, It's talking here about 42 U.S.C. 1983, which is the law that you'd think would allow this man to sue. It was enacted by Congress due to local government officials like sheriffs and constables participating in various civil rights violations and wanted to provide a federal remedy for anybody who uh, encountered that. And so, in 1967, the court created an exception. The court created an exception to a law passed by Congress that essentially provided law enforcement officials with qualified immunity to prevent them from being financially culpable in what could be deemed as frivolous lawsuits. And by the way, uh, there already are protections against frivolous lawsuits. So the advent of qualified immunity was actually a two-step process with a 1967 case and then a 1982 case. So it started in 67, but it really got hammered in in 1982, which is that you have to show a clearly established standard that requires plaintiffs to identify a nearly identical pre-existing case in order to get around qualified immunity. So the court's ruling translated to individuals, uh, which is victims, having to identify previous cases in their jurisdictions in which police violated rights in a seemingly identical way. But of course, you can't find a previous example because that example would have needed a previous example. And so 
until a case makes it all the way up and a, and a higher court says, oh, this is a violation based on a previous violation, they're never going to rule that way. It's, it's, it's the weirdest. It, it, I can't say it's a dog chasing his tail because there is no tail. It's just, it, so if that case doesn't exist or is not factually similar, even if rights were violated or believed to have been violated, officials get a free pass and the case gets dismissed. So qualified immunity has become an extremely controversial legal issue because it creates this defense out of whole cloth. Courts are not really supposed to make policy. They're supposed to rule on existing laws. And so this is one of the examples where the courts invented something that almost everyone looks at and goes, that's wrong, that's wrong. But unfortunately, Congress could fix this, by the way. They could actually rewrite the law and, and make sure this is not in there and then see if the Supreme Court dares reinvent it. So the expert called this a goose gander problem, in which ordinary citizens who are unaware of laws can go to prison. Yet police officers who are trained about issues like probable cause in the Fourth Amendment are likely more aware of the legal precautions, but they get the free pass. So a law professor at UCLA and a faculty director of the David J. Epstein Program in Public Interest Law and Policy wrote in a blog post that... The judge who wrote this opinion is one of the most eloquent and powerful critics of qualified immunity doctrine on the bench. So this expert writes about what the judge is doing here and says the judge denies defendants qualified immunity, concluding that they violated clearly established law. And he goes further demonstrating why qualified immunity is unsupportable as a matter of history, text, and policy. He additionally argues that any concerns about the overturning of settled law, referred to as uh, stare decisis, ring hollow after the court's decision in Dobbs, which overturned Roe versus Wade, which, by the way, is now an interesting conundrum. Without getting into politics, we all know there's a case called Roe versus Wade that came out back in the 70s. And more recently, in a case called Dobbs, the current Supreme Court, a majority of them said, Roe versus Wade was simply a bad case. We're overturning it. Now, I'm not even going to get into the merits of either case because it doesn't matter. The point is that the courts generally follow precedent. So they look to see, well, have we ruled on this in the past? And so for them to say, well, there's a case back here, right on point. But we're going to overturn this case because that case was wrong. (laughs) Means they have now set a precedent of ignoring precedent. That's a mind bender, but it's true. So theoretically, following that same thought process, they could just as easily say, well, you know something, we um, know that there's two cases, Pearson versus Ray and Harlow versus Fitzgerald, the 67 and 82 cases, and they could say those two cases were wrong. We're going to overturn them. They could if they wanted to. Now, it's getting to the point where enough people know that this is a problem, that there is a groundswell of support to get qualified immunity thrown out. And as noted, the only way to do that would be either A, for the legislature to address it and overhaul a bunch of laws, which we know is extremely difficult to do. Uh, We've been trying to get that done on civil asset forfeiture for some time now, and we're getting piecemeal results around the nation. But at the federal level, absolutely no traction whatsoever. They have much more important things to be dealing with apparently in Washington. And so qualified immunity is something that needs to be addressed and needs to go away. And don't get me, you know, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not saying that if you get arrested, you should be allowed to sue the cop just because you want to sue the cop, okay? But when you hear about these outrageous stories of things the police do, and you go, okay, on that case, I can see the person suing the cop. Well, no, you can't, unless you can prove that it's happened previously, blah, 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 blah. And so what's going on here? in case you didn't catch this because it was kind of glossed over and told quickly, is that jailhouse snitches, let's talk about them in general. And there is a long history of this all over the place. There was a famous case out of Detroit, for instance, where the police would arrest somebody and they're convinced they had their guy. Well, this, this is our guy. But we don't have any evidence against the guy. I mean, he kind of fits a description, but the lineup failed, whatever. So what they'd do is they'd throw him in a jail cell for as long as they could. 
And a day or two before he's going to get out, they wouldn't tell him that. They'd put someone else in a jail cell with him who was up on charges for something lesser. And they would tell this person, the lesser charge guy, hey, we're putting you in a jail cell with somebody, and we think he committed a crime. If, if, when we come and get you tomorrow, if you tell us that you spoke to him and he confessed to the crime, and you're willing to testify to that, we'll go easy on you and might even cut you a deal on your, on your underlying charges. And so what happens is you put somebody in the cell with the guy. The next day, when you go get the snitch out, he goes, you're not going to believe this. The guy confessed to me everything. Everything. And they found examples where they would actually feed the snitch information and say, just so you know, we think he was wearing a red shirt and driving a black car. And when the snitch gets retrieved the next morning, he goes, yeah, he confessed the whole thing to me. He put on a red shirt, got in a black car, and committed the crime. The snitch knew things that only the perpetrator would know. And what's weird about this is they were using the same people over and over again. And so there'd be somebody who's testified in all kinds of trials. And now the prosecutors know this, the police know this, but the juries don't know this. And oftentimes the defense counsel didn't know it either. They would just say, hey, we put it, you know, there was, there, there was another inmate that your guy confessed to. So there you go. And now if they did enough research, they'd go, oh, this, way, this guy got confessions from like 12 other people? What? <laughs> What are the odds? This, what, what, the guy's like a priest? Everyone confesses to him? No, he's making stuff up to get an easier deal for himself. And so the weird thing is that you or I might go, I would never believe a jailhouse snitch. But for some odd reason, this is interesting, you put the defendant on the stand, he goes, I didn't do it. A lot of jurors are going to go, oh, he's saying that to get off. You put a jailhouse snitch on who goes, yeah, I was in the cell with the guy. He admitted he did it. Jurors love that. They go, oh, my gosh, that's great, a jailhouse snitch. Well, the jailhouse snitch is doing the exact same thing. He's getting a better deal for saying that. And by the way, a lot of times the jailhouse snitches are known convicts uh, facing serious charges who have a huge incentive to lie. So I have... Almost no faith in a jailhouse snitch. I, if you said, Steve, we've got this case, we've got all this evidence, and a jailhouse snitch. If I was on the jury and you put the snitch on the stand, I'd go, okay, this other evidence must be wrong. Because why would you do that? Why, why would you need that guy? Okay? The guy's a criminal getting a deal for passing a story along that he says he heard, which, by the way, nobody else heard, wasn't recorded. So, and there have been examples where They've documented it and figured it out. Because later on, the jailhouse snitch, when he's got nothing else to lose, goes, oh, by the way, this one detective kept using me because I kept getting in trouble. And, and every time he'd use me, he'd tell me what to find out. He'd say, like, see if the guy was driving a blue car wearing a green shirt. Because if he was, then that's him. Yep, guy told me, driving the blue car with a green shirt. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Things only the defendant would know. <laughs> except that the snitch would know and the cop would know. And, and by the way, that's another one you often hear. We were interviewing the guy, and the guy slipped up and told us something that only the perpetrator would know. Turns out that all kinds of people knew it. I, I mean, I've seen cases before where something was published in the paper, and they said only, only the perpetrator would know it. It's like, well, what about people who read the newspaper? What about the reporter who wrote the story? He knew it. Maybe he did it. What? So... This is interesting, though, because we actually have a judge, district judge, Southern District of Mississippi, so a federal judge in Mississippi saying qualified immunity is wrong. It needs to be overturned, and he's calling on the Supreme Court to do that. Will they do it? Don't know. But hopefully, as more and more cases get brought to them and they start realizing, that, hey, you know something? It was invented out of thin air. Maybe we can overturn it. Maybe we can. So there you go, Jonathan. Everybody else, thanks for sending that from Newsweek. Uh, Supreme Court decision slammed by judge. And the Supreme Court decision, of course, is the one about qualified immunity. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Relax. Nothing is under control.